Hi, I'm Harry Binswanger, the HB in HBTV. And today I'm interviewing Jean Maroney, who, uh, Jean, you may not remember, but I have met you before uh, at the Hotel W 25 <laughs> years ago. We got married and are living happily ever after, ever after. So we've discussed a lot of these issues between the two of us. We talk about these issues over dinner, but I'm going to interview you as if I didn't know the answer. And I don't, in fact, know the whole answer that you've come to on some of these questions. So thank you for being on HBTV and for being my wife. You're welcome. <laughs> and it's a very good time of year to be talking about goal setting since the new year starts in less than a week. Yes, and uh, let's proceed right to the, to the topic. Uh, we're talking about goal setting and the logical first issue is what are goals? And I particularly want you to dis distinguish them from values. Because Ayn Rand, as you know, characterizes a value as that which one acts to gain and or keep. And that mm -hmm. sounds very much like a goal. So how do you make a distinction there? Right. Well, value is the more general term. So everyone has thousands and thousands of values. And the statement that Ayn Rand gives of a value is that which one acts to gain and or keep is a deliberately broad statement. I think in the psychological sense, what a value is, is something that because you have acted to gain and keep it, actually is now tied into your emotional system, into the pleasure pain system, so that it has the ability to generate emotions, so that you actually do feel desires to go get it. You do feel aversion to something that is threatening it. You do feel fear if it's threatened. And you, you do feel joy if you get it. All the emotions are actually evidence, any emotion you have is evidence of a value that you do have programmed into your psychology. But that's thousands of values, thousands and thousands of values. And it reflects your entire history of, of the entire history of your life, everything that you've done, everything that you've gone after, everything that you have acted to gain and or keep. A goal is a very special kind of value because it is much more cognitive than this. It is it's actually a future outcome that you decide you are going to enact the causes to achieve. It is an outcome that you decide under, with your own power and your own choice and your own actions, you're going to make it happen. And that is something that is going to take a lot of creative work. It's going to take some effort. It's something that is going to integrate a lot of activity. It's going to involve more than one goal. So for example, if I have a goal to write a book, say by the end of the year, that's going to involve the choice of topic of the book is going to involve values of mine. The fact that I want to write a book is going to involve, say, communication values. I'm going to write about something I care about. I'm going to do it in order to communicate. I'm going to hold it to various standards like clarity and precision, which are also values of mine. So hundreds, if not thousands of values will be involved in achieving this one objective goal, which is a thing out there in reality that I'm going to create. So a goal is always some kind of an objective outcome that you, in the future, that you choose to, uh, that you, you commit to enacting the cause to make it uh, happen. Is, is that enough of a distinction there for you? No. Great. <laughs> it's a good start, but um, give me an example in the same category of a goal versus a value. Okay. Communication is a, a value of mine. Writing mm -hmm. a book by the end of next year is a particular goal that is essentially a communication goal or uh, uh, a value of mine is uh, romance. And uh, uh, do I have a concrete goal? Actually, I can't think of a particular goal with respect to romance. I better make one up. 
I have a goal of having a date night once a week with my husband. That could be a new thing we do next year. And that would be for romance. So the values would be gained as part of uh, achieving the goal and values are involved in choosing the goal. But the goal itself is the particular outcome that you are working toward. Yeah, I understand that there are two things that I see as measurement differences, and I'm not sure if you, uh, two axes of measurement. I'm not sure if you are saying this or not. One is more uh, goals are more specific and time limited than values. So that they're more the here and the now, although it's not here and now, it's you know soon and there nearby uh whereas a value is more general um it it spans many goals uh well, and it's across a longer period of time so that would be let me just finish there's one yeah. axis and the other axis that you seem to be stressing is the uh the two elements that make up a value are the action towards it and the benefit back to the agent and you seem to be looking at goals as more action towards it, whereas the values are more what you get out of it. Yes, so think? that's actually, that's like three distinctions. And let me, let me say, I don't think it's general specific because you are a huge value to me. You're mm -hmm. probably my top value and you are entirely concrete and specific. I think and I so have. you can have completely concrete values but I don't have a goal. I mean, I had a goal to meet you at a certain point, but I don't have a goal of, Harry is not a goal of mine. He's a value of mine. And I act to you know, gain and keep him in my life, but I, I have him in my life. So it's just to keep him in my life. So uh, in, in that regard, I don't think general specific applies, although goals definitely have to be specific, but values can be specific too. Um, regarding the long-term versus the short-term, I think the difference is that values are, well, the word that occurred to me is not right. The word that occurred to me is eternal. The, the values are ongoing in that once you have formed a value, you still, you have that a value as a value of yours, unless and until you disintegrate it as a value. It's an ongoing thing. So, so, you know, if you have my parent, my mother died a few years ago, she was a value to me she passed away now there's a real sense in which you know she is not i um she's not in my life i can't act to gain and keep her in my life except that i can think about her and remember her and honor her and there's a sense in which she's still a value to me in the sense that i have her connected to a lot of my values but it's 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 eternal in some way uh, yeah well let's take something it's not a person like yes. you know, tennis you tennis. have the value of tennis, right? Uh, and and um, the goal would be, let's say, to raise your rating by half yes. a point in the next yes. six months, or to learn yes. how to serve, or something. Right. And I see yeah. that is more specific and time limited, but tennis is ongoing, right? And, and more general, but right? You don't like and, general, okay? Well, it's not more general, right? Uh, it, it's because not necessarily more general well maybe maybe general tennis is a value right of mine. yeah maybe general less specific less more measurements are omitted uh okay and the uh, third axis well was... but hold on let me just let me just address that mm -hmm. particular one because and the same thing like when i uh, i was sick for a while earlier this year so i couldn't play tennis for several months tennis was still a value of mine but i actually deliberately took away i did not set any tennis goals during that period, because I, it, it was, it would not be realistic. I couldn't actually make that happen. I needed to focus on my health. Whereas now I'm getting back and, and I actually do have a goal to play tennis, get back up to playing tennis three times a week. And so I'm experimenting, I experimented with twice a week last week. So I actually do have that as a goal, but it's based on my present situation. It's something that is getting my special attention. So a goal per se is something that you are actually doing cognitive work on to figure out, well, how do I get this? How do I make this happen? If it's going to happen without any special attention and effort on your part, you don't set it as a goal. 
It needs to be something that if you don't actually put in some extra attention and effort, it's not going to happen. And that's why you set it as a goal. It's actually, that's why I say it's partly cognitive is that you, you, by setting this purpose and having a short list that you can remember, say, you know, a handful of goals at any one time, you can then give them the extra attention they need and you can do the problem solving if you run into setbacks and you can do the uh, decision making about how it is you're going to achieve it. And so uh, when you set something as a goal, you actually are committing to a whole bunch of work associated with that particular outcome. Well, I don't know how much I should press you on this issue because that's not our main topic. Okay. So I, I still think I still would press you on this issue, but we need to go on to why do we need goals in the sense of why not just have fun? Why do we right. need goals? Right. Well, so this gets into uh, what really happiness is. You know, if you if you take a full, you know, a full concept of happiness, of what the kind of depth of happiness you can have in your life, it's true if you don't have goals, you can be contented at a certain point. You can, you know, you can have kind of a low level sort of reactive experience that has a fair amount of pleasure in it. But if you want to have deep happiness, you need bigger achievements and you need, uh, you need longer range things that integrate so that you can't actually be happy if you're being pulled in multiple directions. And the only thing that actually integrates your values is Again, you need the cognition and it's the long range goals that you use, in fact, to integrate your values so they're not pulling you in different directions. So well, goals I, serve. You yeah. said uh, you said the, the thing that integrates your goals and then you change to integrate your values, which so there may, may have been a, a there may have been a slip of the tongue there. Yeah. Could you so, state it again? Right. So it's your motivation can be pulling you in different directions. If you have thousands of values, at any given time, one you might be able to go after and another is being threatened and you're being pulled every which way. Like when you, you kind of think you should be settling down to work because there's good things to happen if you work, but there's also, uh, you could go chat with your friend at the cooler or have a candy bar or something. So you're being pulled in multiple directions. Well, how do you actually, how do you actually manage that motivation? Ultimately, you do it by means of setting longer range goals. I mean, this is a big topic, but when you have a very clear idea of say one long range goal you're trying to achieve, it helps you figure out the priorities on all of these lesser things that you could be doing right now. And I think so it's actually- If, if, if I can uh, push that, uh, if you, um... You think, yeah, uh, tennis is a good thing. I value tennis. I like it. I I'm, I'm want to play more. But you don't set an actual goal. And then you have other things. Yeah, uh, reading history of philosophy is a good thing. I'm going to do more of that. And yeah, right. dining out is a good thing. Those, these are all yeah. values. These things I care about. These are things... Uh, I'm prepared to act again, and maybe I do, you know, one day this, one day that. But if you have goals, specific goals, that tends to make you prioritize and get things done. Is that what you're saying? Right. The goal sets the standard, in effect, for deciding what's important right now, because there are always, you have so mm -hmm. many values. There are many values you could pursue at any given time. Yeah. And by setting a goal, and again, it has to be a few, it can't be that many goals that you set because yeah. you would be overwhelmed. This is how you actually cut through the clutter and say, oh, I see this is an, an actually a part, a lot of the cognition involved with achieving goals is figuring out how the things that are options for you now connect into your longer range goals. That's actually figuring out the means and the ends and making sure that the way that you're pursuing this goal now, you're actually getting some satisfaction, even though you're not gonna finish whatever it is for another year that actually is part of the process and that actually integrates it so that you have an experience of everything in your life is moving you forward you're not being pulled in multiple directions you know, there's that wonderful quote from ayn rand happiness is a state of non-contradictory joy 
a joy without penalty or guilt. And if you're pulled in many directions, you do ha you have non-contradictory joy. You may get pleasure in one area, but it's it feels like it's at the expense of others. Goals integrate your actions around a few big values that you've decided to really work on and uh -huh. help you uh, have it be non-contradictory joy. And when you when you decide not to play tennis, you feel no guilt about it because you know you did it in the surface of something that was a higher priority. So uh, this is the same point then as you need a central purpose to organize your goals. It's the goals organize your time and you need a central purpose to organize your goals. Is that correct? Would you right. So an organ a central purpose is on the scale of your life. And so a central purpose is, you know, a, a major goal, the primary goal with like a three to 10 year time horizon. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that integrates your whole life. And that's what gives you the deepest and most powerful joy. But on the smaller scale, it also works. If you have a one month goal that is going to integrate this month and it is going to give you, if you don't have a central purpose, but you have a one month goal, you're still going to be a happier person than a person who has no one month goals. So the longer range your goals are, the bigger achievements you can have, the bigger joy you can have, the more integrated your life is, the less conflict you feel. Right. And we should say for the record that for Ayn Rand, joy and happiness as fundamental joy come from the achievement of values. And the bigger the value, the bigger the joy. Yes. So that if you just, to take what I said at the outset, do whatever is fun at the moment, you're not going to have any real joy. As you said, you can maybe be contented. Probably you won't yeah. even be that because you, you will lack a sense of identity, won't you? If you're, if you're. It's hard to believe someone could be completely reactive, but even if like you're playing games, Right. Uh -huh. You need to set a goal to win. And if you don't set a goal to win, you won't. I mean, if you do, then you'll mm -hmm. win. And you'll have a little bit of you know, yeah. out of context, brief blip of joy. But you're not going to get that kind of uh, deep, enduring pride, confidence, love, joy combination that really is involved in uh, deep happiness. Yeah, I just thought of a good example. I think I'd like your reaction to it. Suppose uh, you like knitting mm -hmm. and you knit well, maybe while you watch TV or whatever, but you're not knitting anything. You're just knitting. That's not going to bring you much enjoyment compared to you're making a sweater for yourself or somebody you care about. And yeah. there's that goal, right? There's that right. entity taking shape. The finishing is a big part of it. You get the joy when you finish. Yeah. And that's actually one of the things that I teach. And, you know, I teach a lot in my thinking lab that I, I teach a lot about how to pursue goals. And I, you know, my launch program is to help people pursue goals. What is, tell us what is the thinking lab? The thinking lab is a membership program that I have been running since 2008, which involves uh, two monthly classes and periodic what's called thinking days where you can basically ask me questions and get help on your goals and it has a library of resources and I the the topics that I cover are thinking tactics communication skills productivity skills goal setting skills essentialization skills and I've got materials on all of these that I've developed over the last whatever it is 15 how years how long have you been in this game since 1992 30 years 30 this years. year. 30 this year, years. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the thing I wanted to say is part of what you need to do, particularly if you have a long-term goal, is you need to figure out how to get finishing points along the way so you can get some of that observable results as you go. That's actually part of the work that you need to do if yeah. you have a long-range goal, is you need to bring it back so that whatever you're working on now does not feel like you're just endlessly knitting. You're actually completing pieces that you can see, yes, this is materially moving me forward towards my long range. Done goal. the arm. I've done the right yes. arm. Right. Or whatever it would be for knitting. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. How do you get goals? How do you set goals? You just okay. say, okay, that's my goal. What how does how do you do it? 
Well, you need to start with some kind of a short list. And for a lot of people, you make a short list by just sitting down and writing, well, what would I like to do or accomplish in the next uh, you know, few years or years? And the ideal is to get a list of say 10 to 15 of these. Now, some people, when they go, I mean, there are a lot of different tools out there for picking your own brain for trying to come up with possible goals. And you can get a list of 100. And that's going to be too much. And then there are other people who, you know, they say, but I don't have any goals and they just freeze up. So I have a piece of advice for each of those two things. If you freeze up, the reason is probably that you're just either you're at a transition, like if you just finished a major goal, so you just finished writing a book or you just graduated from college or you just retired, you may be at a point where you had goals. And you had these major goals and you just accomplished a major goal and there's just a kind of a gap there. And so it can take a little bit warming up the context. And one thing you can do for this is actually review the last year for achievements or I had someone in the thinking lab went back and reviewed her life. She just retired. She went back and she like looked at all the books on her bookcase and said, oh yeah, I remember being really in interested in that. And, oh yeah, I remember that. And she actually spent, she actually spent a, a month or so reviewing all of her values from her whole life and out of that popped a major goal so one thing is warm up the context now sometimes the reason people think they don't have any goals is that they had goals and they failed on them and they're now basically afraid to set goals and for for them what i would say is make that list with the caveat or that's not the right word with the uh, addendum what would i do if i couldn't fail because you want to get the wishes out there and get the ideas out there without worrying about how you're going to do it at first. You want to tie into what is meaningful to you and then figure out the practicality. And as far as the practicality, I think when people fail, it is about how you set the goal, how you go about doing it. Is the process not motivating enough? And I, I mean, I've got a lot of tools. I've got free tools on my website to help with that. I strongly recommend that's a solvable problem. Uh, how does the objectivist philosophy, specifically the ethics and the epistemology, underlie what you do in your work? Well, it's involved in everything. Like, for example, once you get that long list of goals, you need to prune it down somehow. And like one of the ways that you prune it down is by using moral principles to help you get clearer on things. So for example, if, if some of the things on your list of things that you'd wish to have happen, really it's you want someone else to do something, the virtue of independence can help you say, hmm, I'm trying to put my goal in someone else's action. That doesn't actually quite make sense. I can't control other people. I'm focused on other people instead of reality. What do I, I actually want to create in reality? It can help you reframe that wish that you have into something that is actually under your control. Give me an um, example of that, of a, a goal that might involve other people to centrally. Yeah. Well, so for example, sometimes people say, I wish I could get my husband to uh, uh, be more romantic, let's just say. I don't have this problem with Harry, but let's just take this as an example. And uh, now that's not, you, you, you know, putting it all on somehow he changes is a prescription for failure, right? You, 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 can't you shouldn't manipulate people. You can't control people. You don't want to try to just, you know, reward and punish. That's going to actually ruin your relationship with the person. But if what you really want is a closer relationship, well, that's actually something that is under your control. The oh, okay, so there's a big thing here. Wait a minute. Yes. You're saying that how you define the goal, it can, you know, almost seem like the same thing, but if you really hone it down, you can make a fundamental change in how you hold the goal or how, what the goal is. Yes. And I know you believe in clarifying these yes. things. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Or I is think that, that a diversion? I don't want to divert. I think it's right on the answer to your question. So I'm actually, I actually think you know, I, okay, this is a little bit of a diversion, but 
when I started my business, I was trying to teach people thinking skills. And it turns out nobody thinks they need thinking skills. But I eventually figured out that a lot of people think they need motivational skills. And I'm really teaching them thinking skills disguised as motivational skills. And that is in spades with respect to goal setting. Because precision and uh, clarity is, the, is like 90% of the issue in goal setting which is you need to get it into the thing that really is under your control and you need to state it in precise terms and you need to test it for is it logically true? Does it hold the context? And I think that I use the thinking skills that I learned at the OGC. I use which these is the objective is graduate, graduate center, center which is the Ayn precursor, University. right? Yeah. It's precursor for the OAC and the Ayn Rand University from 30 years ago, <laughs> 30, 28 years ago. And uh, I used those skills to actually uh, be able to set goals more clearly, to figure out what the actual standards were on goal setting, and to teach people how they can actually set the goals more clearly themselves. So I think it, it really is a, it's the place that people need to learn how to essentialize in their, whole, in their own lives is in setting their own goals, figuring out what really matters and making it precise and making it fundamental. Okay, so this is a big thing um, that I have observed in my own introspection that the exact wording of things matters psychoepistemologically to yes. you, to yes. you the thinker. To name it for the, the, to use the, the best name that you can for it and to craft it in a way that resonates the most with you and is proper, logical and moral and everything, is uh, essential. And it's amazing the things that you miss because you don't, you identify them but not exactly the way that would connect with all the other knowledge you have. So that yep. would apply here to goal setting too. You want Absolutely. to name it in the right, exactly right packaged way. Right. And let me give just a little example of this. So one of the yeah. things I teach is how important it is to formulate the goal in terms of values, not in terms of threats. So values you want to gain, not threats you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I don't want to fail that test. So my goal is to not fail the test as opposed to my goal is to get an A on the test. Totally different context that gets activated from your subconscious. If you're focused on threats, what, what, what is connected to threats? Other bad things. What kind of emotions do you have? Fear, aversion, uh, other bad things may involve guilt or frustration. So you get this entirely threat oriented mindset. Is that put you in a good creative place to achieve your goal? No, no, it doesn't. Whereas if you do it in terms of the positive, in terms of the value you're going to gain, the values are actually connected to other values. And that actually activates desire and love and pride and confidence. And that makes it much more likely that you're going to be able to achieve that goal. So, uh, in, to answer the question of how to use the objectivist epistemology, it's not just, uh, well, you've got to be clear about your goal because otherwise you may, you may miss it some way. You know, you may, if you have an approximate goal, it's, it's not going to be clear whether you get it or don't get it, which is kind of a bromide. No, it's the much deeper point that the mind works by explicit ideas that you've crafted and that yes. the more units you can save, the more economical you can be in your use of units, the more powerful the awareness will be. Yes. So it, what, you're, what you're saying, a lot of people talk about values clarification. Yeah. That's a slogan, and it has nothing to do with what you're saying now. That's uh, just, oh, I realize I'm a people person. <laughs> that, would, that would pass as values clarification. Um, so you're talking about activating the subconscious to, 
in a positive way, not a negative way. And for exactly with exact the the clarity and the power of an exact naming of something. Yes, exactly. Okay. Right. I'm on board with that. I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah. So we are at uh, the official end. Uh, Daniel, have there been any uh, there, chat? There are a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, I see. I so see. You can take a few minutes. Five to of them. Answer. You want me? You want to try to? Because the other possibility is we could just do this next week. But I could try to. We could try to whip through them. Uh, let's. Um, are there any that are real short to answer? Can you tell? Uh, <laughs> well, I could force myself to answer in a short way for all of them, but <laughs> I'd love to talk about all God, of them. I wish more. I could do that. You want me to give the short answers and then you can decide later whether you want me to give long answers. How about that? Well, the one about integrating psychology and philosophy is not short. Yeah, I think you and I would have to have a dinner conversation about that. So why don't I just go through them quickly? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So uh, first question. We don't read who the names are. Okay, here. right. Ed Locke's book, Theory of Goal Setting, which is this book, it's actually Locke and Latham, A Theory of Goal Setting and Task Performance. Uh, question is, is this relevant? Well, so Ed is the person who got me interested in psychology because of a lecture on goal setting I saw with him, saw on him in 1989. So it's definitely relevant in my view. So Ed, Ed and um, I, Dr. Locke and Dr. Latham, you know, they really pushed goal setting. So there's been a lot of research on goals. Now, this book is a very technical uh, academic book, and it's designed to explain the academic things that he, uh, they proved in their experiments. So it's not really a handbook on how to do goal setting. It's a theory of it. So uh, I'm, I'm an advocate of Ed. He's been a big help to me over the years. It's not it's not necessarily the book you need to read if what you need is help goal setting. Uh, um, before you go on, I, before that, he wrote a book that impressed me, um, A Guide to Effective Study. study. Mm -hmm. And in it, the thing that he said that impressed me because it was silly sounding, but was actually deep, was if you're studying for a test, and you want to do well in the test, when you come to something that you should remember, say to yourself, I need to remember this. Yes. And that, that fits right in with what we were talking about yes. in terms of naming your goals and, and crafting yes. a statement. So I, obviously he wasn't talking about a perfunctory, oh, I need to know this, I need to remember. But did you really, re yeah, this is going to be on the, I need to know this. I need to remember this. That can have a big impact on the brain. Right, okay. fair enough. Uh, the next question, are goals dependent on values, but not vice versa? Well, the main way that you organize your value hierarchy is by setting goals. So by choosing to set a goal and choosing to act to gain and keep it, you're actually reprogramming your value hierarchy. So I, there, it, there is an interrelationship between these. That's yeah, actually the- I, I'm sorry, you stress action. That, yes, that that's, the, that is the, that's really the way you program a value hierarchy is through action. Thinking is a little bit of action, but action, action, actually going out and do something in the world, that really reprograms your value hierarchy. Um, the next one is a follow up on the Ocon talk on happiness, which is up on ARI is put up on the web. I'm still confused on the definition of happiness. It isn't an emotion, but is it fair to call it combinate fair to call it a combination of several other emotions, joy, confidence, etc. Is that a state of consciousness? So state state of consciousness is what I would say is the genus. And the reason I would not call it an emotion is that an emotion is a temporary short-term response to a with, based on a particular evaluation. And we're talking about a long-term state. That's exactly the point I was trying to make in the talk. So an emotion is by its nature short, you know, few minutes. And we're talking about a long-term state that obviously involves a lot of positive emotions, 
but not just, I mean, you can be unhappy some of the time and still basically be essentially happy. And that's not, uh, that's not counter, counter to it. It was, as I said, I think you need to be in some state of positive state 80 to 90% of the time, and then you're happy for that period. Uh, so I hope that helps clarify it. So, it, okay, and this is an issue of, well, what is the genus? What are you distinguishing it from? You distinguish happiness from things like suffering and serenity, not from hope, frustration, anger, gratitude. It's a different genus is what it is. Um, how did, and the last one, uh, I, the last one is actually off topic, so maybe we can do that separately. The next to the last one, the last one's on Elon Musk. Yeah. Do you think that if you want me to say something on that, I'll try to say something. Yeah, that would be interesting. So okay. the question is, how does a central purpose for someone like Musk, who has several major different enterprises active? Actually, it's not quite. He's missed a word here. What, what is his central purpose or how does that work? He's got several major different enterprises active concurrently. Well, uh, I, first of all, I am certain, and, and people have said this, when he goes and he focuses on Twitter, he is not able to put that kind of attention on the other businesses. So how does he do that? He has to have a team. I mean, this is one of the things you learn if you want to be a businessman. You need to actually put a team in place and you need to clone yourself in various ways. And the thing that you can do is actually put a, uh, a culture in place so that not as much of your time is needed. And you set the vision and you set the culture and then you let the team, you delegate the work to the team. Whereas that's not, as he moves his focus, he can only do that real creative thing in one thing. Now you can have other goals. You can have other major goals. I mean, I have, um, I mean, I run a business. I actually, I do intellectual development and I teach classes, teach classes as part of the business, but it's really different from marketing. And those are all major, but what I think you do is you only have one of those goals that is really requiring the big push mentally and emotionally at one time and the others you can keep in some kind of a maintenance mode and that's one of the reasons why i'm sure musk has delegated things at his other companies because one of the ways that you can put things in maintenance mode is by having a team that you can delegate to so you only need to supervise it takes less of your time and energy and i think he now thinks he bit off more than he could chew with twitter yes there's certainly some yeah, evidence of that and his shareholders at Tesla are saying, come back and right. work on Tesla, concentrate yes. on Tesla. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we can't assume that everything he does is, is an example of having a central purpose. Right, right. I mean, okay. I, yeah. I, I really think we have to stop. It's 10 minutes after our allotted time. Thank and you very much. I hope to see you at the dinner table. <laughs> I hope to see all of you next week on HBTV, which will be a session on Ask Harry Anything. Goodbye for now. Thanks, Harry.